Star Talk, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. This is a special installment. This is where we take an in-depth look at the Cosmos Possible World series, episode by episode, and unpack some of the content that you've seen. I got with me Chuck Nice. That's right. As always, Chuck hey, in the house. Hey, boom. Wait, who do we just do this in front of? Uh, we always do this in front one, of our guests. The one and only. <laughs> Heather Berlin. Heather Berlin. Heather, a uh, friend yeah. of Star Talk. Yes. Yeah, thanks for coming back on. Brain expert. Oh. Neuro, neuro. Scientist? Neuroscientist, <laughs> sure. Um, we're going to talk about episode five, the connectome. The connectome. Tome. Cool word. One of my it favorite is. new words, at least in my vocabulary, the mm -hmm. connectome. And it's an entire episode that explores basically the wiring of the brain. Yeah. But we do it through a story told by um, a, 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 a case where it's the first time I think brain waves were ever measured mm -hmm. to have some understanding that there's something real going on in there. Right. And it's not mm -hmm. just um, whatever it is you think it is, we, we, we can measure it. Right. Something about it. Yes. And it, which we can. <laughs> which we can. And, and it pivots on a story of, of a boy who suffered from epilepsy. Right. Mm -hmm. So, Heather, could you just update us? On, well, give us the foundation of what epilepsy is and how people used to think about it. And how's this boy? How's he doing? <laughs> how's he doing now? How's the boy doing? Yeah, he's 130. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, you know, depending on how far back you go, right? They used to think it was you were possessed by evil spirits, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, and as you say in the episode, um, Hippocrates was sort of one of the first people who said, no, this is actually coming from the brain. Right. Or in fact, from he called the body. it a sacred disease. Right. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. And yeah, uh, yeah. we're pretty sure he was referencing epilepsy yeah. when he made that reference. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then, you know, went through a series of different, but I would say around like in the 1800s was when they first realized this was a brain disease and that it was coming from, um, electrical, you know, problems with the electrical activation, let's say. So it had to be brain. late enough in the 1800s so that we'd have some sense of electricity. Right. right? To then, right. to say, hey, let's put this with that. Because the physicists right. were were rapidly making discoveries. Yeah. Ben Franklin, my right. man, of course, my made a lot of guy. progressive uh, 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 progress in this. Right. Mm. Uh, he published a book, Experimental Researchers into Electricity. Right. So Europe ah. knew him as a scientist. That's right. right. We knew him as a... as a. Uh, well, we also know him as a scientist. As a beer-drinking founding <laughs> father. We know him as that, too. Well, <laughs> he was multi-talented. He was very... Yeah. Wait, well, if you pull out your Benjamins, there is no reference to his science on that bill. That is true. I yeah. just want you to know. Yeah. That is true. Okay? Yes. Had that been in Europe, they would have had his kite, his the key. Right. Absolutely. He would have had a lightning bolt. They would have had stuff in i'm just saying yes they they, yeah. they they honor their scientists in deeper ways than we do here yes but it's a great example of how all the sciences are interrelated exactly yeah exactly. because when you make a discovery in one field it can have implications and another other guy with a twitchy frog leg that oh was, yes uh, yes Le, the italian guy whose name is lou, lou with an l <laughs> thanks for clearing that one up <laughs> thanks, good, save. good save <laughs> good save there <laughs> All good. <laughs> Him, right. that famous scientist who came up with um, that electrical impulse in the nerves. Um, that and they have then, anything to do with each other at all. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Are you sure his name begins with L? I, I, I don't think I don't, so. I don't know. Luigi. Oh, no, you know, oh, you on a first name no. basis? <laughs> no, I think you're just being racist now. <laughs> Some Italian, Italian guy. Italian guy named Luigi. Lu Luigi. Right. <laughs> no, so who, Luigi who? Lu Luigi Galvani. Galvani. Yeah. Very okay. Nice. Yes. Very nice. Cool. All right. And cool. then it was until the early 1900s where we can actually measure the electrical activity in the brain with the invention of the EEG. Right. Um, Electroencephalograph. Okay. Yes, right. encephalograph. Exactly. Uh -huh. um, and so we we still use that technology today right. to uh, diagnose epilepsy. I mean, there's there's some you know other ways that we can look at it, but that is sort of the gold standard still. I mean, it's a more advanced EEG system, but right. we're still measuring the electrical activity in the brain. More advanced is because we can measure now. Uh, lower level activity yes. or more precision or is our ability to interpret better or we can localize it in the brain better? I'm is it all of, the, all above? of the above? All of that. All, all, all of the above. Wow. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we combine that with other, um, with neuroimaging where we can actually look inside the brain and look do CT scan or an MRI and to see if there's any lesion in the brain that can be, let's say, the focus of the epileptic So you seizure. have to know what the brain 
should look like without the lesion. Right. Right. So you've done this on normal patients, presumably, or unafflicted patients. Yeah, you have healthy controls, let's call Who them. Who agree to this. To have their brains looked at. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can have it as a screensaver. I mean, it's it's cool to have a picture of your brain. It's a nice parting gift. Yeah. You know? <laughs> We're going to zap you and take a look at your brain. Yeah. But listen, I'm going to give you a picture of it. <laughs> so, what, so what causes it? Um, that's an interesting question. There are a number of different we call Just ideologies. Check, when yeah. a scientist said that's an interesting question, it means they don't have the answer. <laughs> that's right. So that's not, right. Okay. That's lingo. That's Very nice. Okay. Let's yeah, try yeah, this yeah. again. We'll get it. So now uh, that's get, a completely <laughs> uninteresting question. <laughs> <laughs> that means they really don't know. <laughs> that's even better. That's even better. <laughs> uh, yeah. let's, let's, let's roll the tape and do it again. Yeah. So, so, so what Heather, causes it? Nobody wants to talk about that. <laughs> Heather, what? what okay. It's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> it becomes a Facebook status now. <laughs> um, no, I mean, there are a number of different causes. Some of them are genetic. You're born with it. Others are um, what we call acquired, meaning that if you have, so you get it later in life and it could be related to having a lesion in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, a lot so, of the oh, times, brain trauma. Brain, brain trauma yeah. then can cause it. I mean, right. we even see, we can induce an epileptic seizure um, in surgery when we are doing brain mapping. So a person is doing surgery, let's say, to remove a tumor or to remove Stop. the- I just, what, I have what, to stop. Yeah, yeah. What? What, what, why, why would you want to, want to <laughs> bring indeed. someone to a state no, of an doing, epileptic we're not doing seizure? It on purpose. We don't do it on purpose. Oh, okay. It's an accident. Right. So we're doing something else in the brain. So when we are, um, people are in surgery and we, let's say we're remo removing a tumor or actually we're removing part of the brain that's the focus of the epileptic seizure because that's sometimes a treatment to remove where the seizure starts. What's his name? Ben Carson. Um, Oh, what does he have? Hemispherectomy. Oh, wow! Ben Carson. That was, was done to him. He, no, he oh, was. Okay. <laughs> he was. He was one of the first. He was one of the progenitors of the hemispherectomy. Only in small children, finding right. that the brain could recover if you removed large hemisphere. pieces of it. That uh, the associations and the workloads were distributed to other parts of the brain that mm -hmm. picked up right. the slack. Okay, right. Chuck, that's why we have her. Oh, right. 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 <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, we used to do. <laughs> so <sorry. laughs> I like that. Picked up the slack. Picked up the slack. Mm -hmm. um, well, we used to do a, uh, what we do, call, cut the corpus callosum, which is the connections between the two hemispheres. So if a, a seizure started in one hemisphere, it couldn't so spread, it spread over. over. Okay. So that's another option. So that was the first blunt measure right. to, to, to contain it. Exactly. But now we can go in and remove the, if we find the focus, then we can remove that. But during surgery, sometimes we want to make sure, for example, we don't remove the language area of the brain. So we do electrical stimulation piece by piece while the person is awake during surgery and talk to them and make sure like oh, which part is involved in language. As soon as they start messing up, they can't speak. We're like, okay, don't touch that part. Mm -hmm. But in the course of that, of putting Are tiny you okay? electrical yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Okay. basically what happens. All right, guys. <laughs> We've gone don't too far. Go too, yeah, go, go too far, go too far. But we do these tiny um, sort of electrical impulses, <laughs> but sometimes that can trigger, trigger a seizure in people. Oh. So we can accidentally trigger, and not the full clonic time, you know, where they're moving around right. and things, but we can see it via the electrical activation. Oh, gotcha. And basically okay. is what it is, is that the neurons start firing in sync at the same time, which we don't want. We want the neurons right. to be evenly distributed. And because so then it becomes like brain noise, right? If they're uh, all, if yeah. is it like a dis, like if everything's going at the same time, it's almost like your brain doesn't know what to do. Yeah, it's like miscommunicating. Mis so it's right. not communicating in the right way, right. and it, and it's problematic. And not everybody has the movements. Some people just have what we call absence seizures, where they just stare no. What's that? Off what's it called? Absence. Absence. Which is like absence, but with a French accent, uh. like absence. <laughs> It's, it's, like, it's like Chuck when you when you have a, a bowel movement. <laughs> <You know? laughs> All right, you got me. You totally got me. Yeah, yeah, right. Bowel movement. Movement. You go into the That's base mall to have a bowel movement. Okay, this is <laughs> in French. It all sounds bad. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 So okay. So I'm just they missing just, the the traditional. <clears throat> they don't. So symptoms. it's not in the motor cortex where they get the full body movements, mm. which is what we often think of with a seizure. It's a different type of seizure but where they suddenly can be talking and then just lose conscious, they just stare off into space for a few seconds uh -huh. and then suddenly come back. Oh, so these are little, little so seizures. So it's like this seizure where the brain activity is going, but it's uh -huh. not affecting the motor cortex and you just suddenly become unconscious, but your eyes are open, you stare off into space and you come back again. So there are all these different ways in which seizures could occur. There are all different types of seizures. Can you diagnose it today before someone has ever had a seizure? Diagnose um, that they would or could? 
prone to have them. Prone, well, that's, yeah. what I'm looking for. You know, I mean, we could, but normally we wouldn't look in somebody who's never had a seizure before for seizure activity. So, I mean, theoretically, you could record and see if a seizure happens to occur, but it's unlikely that we would do that. So, yeah, I, but also, wait, wait, but it also means you're missing some data because right. the pre- Morbid. Se okay. The uh, pre what? Pre-morbid. What does that mean? That would be like the pre before the disease sort of emerges. Why'd you use the word morbid? I don't know. You just call it <laughs> okay. That's what you call it. It's a pre morbid. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. It, cer it certainly isn't happy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so if you. Well, it's before the morbid stuff happens. Right. Okay. So <laughs> it seems to me mm -hmm. that would or could be highly useful. Mm. To but you'd have to scan so many right. people, yeah. Yeah. and you don't know who the one is going to be. And there's some genetic links, so maybe if it runs in your family, you'd be more likely. Oh, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So let me ask you this: I have a friend who fell while he was mountain biking. Okay, yeah. now he did not hit his head, or maybe he did, and right. we're not sure. Right. He fell on his back. Yeah. Okay, and he fell on his spine, and then he started having kind of I'll call them micro seizures. Right. But what would happen is his leg would involuntarily just kick right. for no reason at all. And this went on for months. Right. And the doctors were like, hey man, you damaged something. We don't know exactly what you damaged, mm. right? And then after about seven months, and I'm talking about every four or five minutes, his leg would just kick out, just right. kick for no reason. And he went through life like that for seven months and then it just went away. Interesting. I don't know if that was seizure activity, although you can fall and not hit your head and, and the brain shakes within the skull and then you can get micro lesions in the white matter, which is the connectivity, okay. which might have happened, but it could just be a, a basic motor problem in his, oh, okay. in his spinal cord. All right. That's my diagnosis official. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so tell me about the concept of a connectome. Right. This is we use the term in the in the in the in the show, mm -hmm. and the show's very Cosmos is very forward looking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll take some cutting edge things and see what you know how we can explore what that could do for us. Mm -hmm. So where's the connect state of the connectome now? Well, so the connectome is this idea if we can sort of map out every connection in the human brain, sort of the way it's wired, all the wiring, which is a, actually just a very difficult task in and of itself. So there's a project called the Blue Brain Project in Lausanne in Switzerland run by Henry Macrum, and he's gotten like 100 billion, or no, not 100 billion, I would say a billion euros um, to do this. And he spent all That's this money- That's one euro per- Neuron. <laughs> ah, well, no, wow. no, no, that's not because there's like about 86 billion neurons, and that's so that's oh, okay. one billion dollars. Okay. So if you do the math, it's Okay. A little less, but uh -huh. yes, yeah. What's it's the conversion rate from euros it's to neurons? neurons. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's so, a lot of money. Yeah, a lot of money, a lot of effort. In any of, currency, it's a lot of money. Yes, a lot of people, a lot of effort, and and the most we could do is sort of map out the specific connections in one tiny little column, you know, maybe sort of a millimeter of cortex. And so you can imagine doing this over the entire brain. It's a huge project. And then the next question is, and, so we'd get some information. And what, what are you going to do with that? Right, what do we do with that information? I mean, obviously information is good for you know, f for many things, but but that's so sort of controversy in the field about is it worth it to invest all of this money in this project mm. um, ter in terms of like what the benefits are when we could be investing in, I don't know, you know, research in Alzheimer's or whatever. And the idea is that theoretically this can help with those endeavors I'm in the missing long something. Run. Yeah. Wiring to me is not the same thing as what signals are going over the wiring. Right. That's the activation. S okay. So, so what does it mean to have the wiring if you have no idea what the person is thinking? Ult exactly. I mean, so ultimately, th the first step is to sort of get a map, a brain map of all the connections. And by the way, all of our brains are different. And and also, while our brains are active, they are changing the wiring in time. So right. it's not a static thing, Ooh, wow. right? So that's the other issue. So then they're like, oh, well, we want to map that plus function. And then it gets to be a very overwhelming, difficult task. So it could it be diverting like money that people might want to spend on other things. On even other if areas the, of research. Even if it's an objectively interesting topic right. yeah the, the the fertility of the results might not measure up to other places you could be researching exactly like there are other interesting here for example they're doing work at the um paul allen um brain institute in seattle where they're looking at mapping the genome and seeing how those the genes map out onto brain development and you know looking at that i think that could be more fruitful in many ways mm -hmm. um 
But so so I think, you know, there are pluses and minuses with it. It's not I wouldn't say it's a it's a it's a bad endeavor, but it's just a question of resources right. and how it, much are we going to put. It kind of seems like they should be spending money on better ways of seeing into the brain. Right. Because that will solve the issue that you're talking but, about. You know what it is? Ironic. So it actually relates to some of the things you often say about, like, invest in research in NASA because those discoveries are going to be related to other things. Mm-hmm. So some of the research you're doing to figure out the connectome is actually related to developing new techniques to look into the brain. Okay. And look at it in a micro at the micro yeah, these, scale. These are, these are the off ramps so, from that same line of research. Right. So in yeah. that way, that is a benefit. Yeah. Um, That's for an off ramp. You didn't even see what's coming Correct. until it's there. Until in front it's of there in front of right. you. And it, you know. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I mean that could revolutionize it because let's say, for instance, you come up with a means of looking into the brain that is democratized, so that it's not as much money to look into everybody's brain. Now you can start to actually get a better sense of what that map is. And they also have they actually have this video game where people can play that adds the data to it. I think it's called like I... Minecraft. I'm pretty sure it's called (laughs) Minecraft. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. But you know how that everybody contributes to the data. Is it Pong? Is that the one? That would take a long time to get that data. But yeah. Um, So I think it has benefits. And also the other other aspect of it is that some people think ultimately if you can like map out all the wiring of your brain and download it somehow that would like give you, you know, immortality which I don't don't buy that argument. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, so the real exactly. connectome investors, they want right. their stuff. That's what they, they want. want. They want to preserve their content. That's what, if I'm a billionaire. Oh my, yeah, that's the, you know, there's this, um, okay, forget it. I'm getting I'm ready to go on a tangent. <laughs> Shut <laughs> up, Chuck. Great self-control. <laughs> Good job. Okay, so Heather, Heather, we got to bring this to a close, but yes. thank you for being back on Star oh, Talk. I love being Giving us some insights yeah. into yeah, epilepsy is... to, by the way, that episode is one of the saddest for me, just thinking of the plight of the child. And uh, the, yeah. I remember just. There's a lot of sad stories in that episode. Yeah. This yeah episode. I was Tan, 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 the patient who had the lesion. In yeah, yeah, Tan. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, it was. Tan. He was the first um, Hordor. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With the repeated term. Hordor. Right. That's yeah. it. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yes. Thanks for having all me. All right. All in. So we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll chat about episode six of Cosmos Possible Worlds on Star Talk. We're back, Star Talk. And right now we're going to talk about episode six. Yes. Chuck, you were saying you liked that episode. I did very much. Yeah, it's quite the profile of Carl Sagan's role. Yeah. Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan's role as a (laughs) scientist. What impact he had on the path that scientific research took. Yeah. Coming out of the 1950s into the 60s and right on up through the 70s and 80s. You know, what's funny is Heather brought it up in, you know, before we Mm -hmm. went to break talking about how one scientific discipline is connected to another. Yes. And that's the whole thing with his- Well, if you don't know it is, because you were taught that here's your geology book. Right. And that that, that book. Right. Now put that down and pick up the biology book. Mm-hmm. You know, who's gonna, what? That can't possibly leave you in a good way to make cross-pollinated connections. Yeah, I mean, even See what I we, did there? Cross, yeah, cross cross-pollinated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I got you. But like, um, oh man, who's your, I, I'm senile, so you have to forgive me, but he, he works here at the museum with you and we were talking about Olivine and how- uh, Olivine, so that'd Olivine. be Denton Abel, yeah, yes. who's the chair of the division of physical sciences. Yeah. Right, and so- That's the, what he does. He talks about the formation of minerals in the, in, in the birthing solar systems. Right, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But who would think that these so-called rocks that we find here have a direct connection to you know the cosmos and the, the way that they do phenomena. astrophysical it, exactly. phenomena. Thank you. So, so Carl Sagan, I think, was one of the first. You know, you, there are terms we have today that we just take for granted. Mm-hmm. Right? These are words stapled together that you don't even hear as stapled together anymore. Okay. Right? So. Astrobiology. Astrobiology. That's two different fields. Two different fields coming together, yeah. Two different, uh, astrophysics. Astrophysics. (laughs) Actually, that came first. Uh, Okay. We we got that one first. Right. That's back in 18, late 1800s. Right. Astrogeologist. Astrogeology, biogeology, all of these terms are the tacit recognition that creative juxtaposition of discoveries can lead to a whole other discovery that would otherwise be completely impossible because no one's stovepipe will ever go there. Right. That's what exactly. that is. So yeah. what do you think of the animations? You have 
Oh, I loved it. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, what I like about it is the fact that it brings me into the story in ways I otherwise would not be. Mm-hmm. You know, and sometimes I find myself looking at the animation and going, "Oh." <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, you know, the the pedigree of that animation comes from the fact that Fox, which was acquired, the Fox Animation Studios, along with 20th Century Fox and 21st Century Fox, were all acquired by Disney. Okay, but they were all under the same house in a family that included National Geographic. So we have Cosmos airing on National Geographic in collaboration with Fox talent that come from their animation studios. Right. So we didn't have to shop hard to find people who would have the talent to do this. Yeah. And what something I I always liked about the animation is if you look at the facial expressions and just gestures of the eyebrows and the the cheeks, there's very subtle movement. Oh, yeah. It speaks volumes. It though. speaks volumes. Yeah. You're feeling the characters, even though they're like animated. Yeah. You know, when you think of animation, you think of like Bugs Bunny or yeah. cartoons no, and things, no. not as a serious medium to communicate that's historical I, drama. That's why I say sometimes they'll do something in the animation and it, I react to it as if I'm watching people, you know. Yeah, actual I feel, people. I feel kind of silly. <laughs> I mean, I, no, I really do. <laughs> you know? But what I found. Your, came, your kids laugh at you. Yeah, exactly. It's like, bro, that ain't real. Like, <laughs> you know, calm yeah, here's down. Here's Kleenex, you know. Said, right, yeah, yeah, take it easy, true. man. He's. You know, but what it's a I, drawing of the person, it's a, not right, the actual you know, person, right? You know, um, and I also love seeing it makes the scientists that are no longer here, like Kuiper, like looking up at the sky as a kid, yeah, and it brings you into it. It's like, okay, I get it now. And, and he had really good vision, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yep. Uh-huh. So, you know, I mean, I find that you know, that's fascinating. One of the things, by the way, I'm glad that the such a person who had really good vision became an astro person. That, that yeah, because kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And think about it: of the of your five traditional senses, mm-hmm. vision. This, I'm stating the obvious, but it bears stating. Your vision gives what what what's the point of your senses? They give us information mm-hmm. about the world around us, so that we can choose to interact in whatever way is in the interest of our survival. Right. Okay, that's what our senses do Mm -hmm. all right and so sight is the one sense that can detect information about an environment from the farthest distance right okay that makes sense okay yeah because you can certainly see a heck of a lot farther than you can hear than you can hear okay or uh smell is pretty good smell is good but but still not as far as us right not not in us not in us not in us right maybe a dog Dog, dog 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 so that's on Earth, but of course, we can take our sense of sight beyond Earth. Right. And the farthest thing you can see with the unaided eye is the Andromeda galaxy. Mm-hmm. It's visible to the unaided eye, and it's two million light years away. That's pretty so, wild. Right, right. So here's Kuiper with extraordinary acute sense of sight, and so I'm good with that. Yeah, <laughs> it's very cool. So what I also found interesting, mm-hmm. you know, when they talk about Carl Sagan, is as I'm now, of course, for me, maybe other people aren't looking at it like this when they're watching the show mm-hmm. because I know you and I know your story. Yeah. So I'm looking at this and I'm like, here is the dude doing Cosmos who was actually mentored by the dude who did Cosmos. <laughs> but Would of you, course, wait, they, wait, 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 they wait, never wait, say that wait, in, wait, the, in, the, in the app. Wait, they gotta don't talk about finish that. Finish the meta. Who's the dude? Who's portrayed in the story right. of, 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 of Cosmos? Exactly. Right. It's super cool, though. I'm like looking at you, and I'm like, people. I don't. I don't. You know. I don't know if you want to tell the story, but you know your your actual interaction and intersection with Carl Sagan is pretty pretty cool story. Well, we we told it in the in Cosmos 2014, but maybe not everyone saw that one section of one episode of that series six years ago. Right. But I'm happy to tell it again. Yeah. When we tell it again. I think it's great. And and by the way, I think it's part of the entire profile of his character. Yes. And and so, how you broke his heart. No. <laughs> broke his heart, man. No. So I'm applying to colleges. <laughs> yes. I'm in high school here in New York City. Mm-hmm. Public schools. Right. And I'm and my application is dripping with the universe. Right. Just dripping. And I'm accepted at Cornell University. Right. But I don't know if I'm going to go yet because I have other. I'm waiting for other decisions, other colleges, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. so big brain problems. <laughs> Stop. Big brain problems. 
Where should I go? <laughs> Cornell, <laughs> Yale, Stanford, Harvard. Where? I, I did not apply to Stanford or, or, or Yale. Oh, really? No, no. Uh, you, you, sir, did not want to have the boorish manners of a Yale. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like Thurston Howell the Third from whoever remembers that from from Gilgan's Island. He was a Harvard right. person in it. Um, anyhow, so unknown to me, the admissions office sent my application to Carl Sagan. He was already famous. He hadn't done Cosmos yet, right. but he was on the Tonight Show and right. best-selling books and right. was interviewed. So he was already fam as famous as any scientist had been. Right. So, you know, since probably since Einstein, mm -hmm. and he. They sent my application to, him, to his attention. He wrote me a letter, and the letter comes in the mail, and it's Carl. And I open it up, and it says, "Hi, I'm Carl Sagan, and I heard I understand you're thinking about colleges. I do astrophysics here, and I invite you to come visit to help you decide. And let, just let me know. Signed, Carl. That's amazing. Signed, Carl. That's awesome." And I get the letter, and it's like, and, and mom and daddy, bap, deep, dab, dab. And so I said, should I go? And I and this is New York City. He's in Ithaca, New York. It's right. a five-hour bus ride right. or so. Yeah. And so I, I arrange the visit. We arrange the visit, and I go. And he meets me in the front of his building. This is on a Saturday. He's there. Wow. Okay? And he's taking me shows, gives me a tour of the lab, and I'm in his office. And he's sitting. I'll never forget this. Chuck. I'm sitting across from his desk. And he doesn't even look. He reaches back, grabs a book as one of his books that he wrote. Didn't even look. Yo, this is this is this is like the no look pass in basketball. Right. This is a no look grab. Just and, grab anything. It doesn't matter. It's a book he wrote. Anything behind me is something I wrote. <laughs> okay. Pulls it out, signs it to me. I still have that book. Okay. That's signed to Neil, future astronomer. Okay. Signed Carl. All right. So should have signed an intellectual gangster because <laughs> that is gangster. <laughs> Let me just reach back <laughs> here. <laughs> And grab anything. <laughs> and oh, what do you know? It's just a book I wrote. Look at that. I just reach behind me, and anything I pick is a book. I Here you go. I'm, this is for you. Here so you sign go. Carl the sign Gangster. Carl the, ga right. <laughs> the gangster author. So there you right. go. So, but that's not where it ended, right? right. So we're done, and he we walk outside, and it begins to snow, as it does so often in, in Ithaca, in New York. Yeah, without right? a doubt. And it's, um, so it begins to snow. It might have been lake effect snows. I'm not sure. Very nice. I love lake effect snows. Well, yes. One day I, we'll do I a... hear they speak highly of you as well. <laughs> <laughs> the lake effect tribe. Yes. <laughs> One day maybe we'll do an a info on lake effect snows. Yes. It's, it's a fun concept. Yeah. So, but anyhow, so I'm there and he says, he writes down, here's my phone number. It, it snows heavier and the bus can't get through. Come spend the night with my family and you leave tomorrow. This guy, he clearly saw something in you. Well, so here's the thing. I And I had people, when I told some people that story, they said, you should have just said the bus couldn't go through. Exactly. <laughs> so they go to have dinner with him and right. hang out and see his library, exactly. and talk astrophysics. So, so the point is, to this day, I treat other students the way he treated me. Oh, that's very cool. I, I mean, if I'm at the desk... And a, st a student comes by knocking, and I'm, I'll say, uh, Barack, I'll got to call you later. I got a student <laughs> coming in. I got to <laughs> exaggerate, a oh, but only a little bit. Uh, right, there, right. Only a little bit. Yeah. So I just said to myself, it, that's, I have to be that if I'm ever where, anywhere near that. Otherwise, what, what am I doing here? So, well, good for you, so there's, there's a passing of the torch. Yeah. I think he understood the value of not only education in general, but the value of a mentor to a student. So was that experience the single greatest influence to causing you to become now probably the world's most renowned science communicator? And I say that objectively, not as... Even though we, we sign your paycheck. Well, yes. That's why I had to say I say it objectively. <laughs> objectively. <laughs> because perhaps I could have a bias or yeah. reason for bias. You just disclose the possible uh, sources exactly, of bias. Exactly, yes. Okay. So full it's disclosure. disclosure. It's just full, full disclosure. disclosure. <laughs> uh, Chuck is a wholly owned subsidiary. <laughs> of Star Talk Radio. <laughs> So, and, but, but yes. <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, you're only partially owned. You do well. You got your yeah, own. I got a lot of bunch of other crap. But great, which is always great. Um, so, I would say it influenced my. It influenced what kind of a scientist I would become. Hmm. Interesting. And I, I think back on it. And now, now I'm, I'm behind my desk. 
It's, it's, it's someone comes in. I, right. I, I, no, I, I reach back. Right. I can oh. do that. I can do that now. Oh snap! I, I can do that. That is true. I can do that. I you can you can book. pull out your own. book. I pull out the oh, my uh, own book. Uh, pardon me. I learned this from Carl Sagan. <laughs> Right behind. Oh, what do you know? It's a Neil deGrasse Tyson. But let me. Who should I make this out to? Who should I make this out to? <laughs> so, because I, it was, as is clear from the story, I already knew I wanted to do astrophysics course, from course. very early, even before I knew of him. Right. So he wasn't. He didn't influence my career arc. He influenced my career um, attitudes and uh -huh. perspectives. Uh -huh. And that's important. That's because very that's important. Shape, that's part of the shape that well, you take. Well, because that part, the, the, the other part you're talking about had already been formed from the time you were a kid. You right, already, right. Some people know what they want to do, and right, so, you know, right. that's cool. So, I, wait a minute. I, you I, told him, no, you're not going to, you're not going to so Cornell. So, he did write back and endorsed my decision. Okay. Just so you know. That's cool. Okay. So, now, what there, would There were no make... teardrops on the, on the thing. But here's the deal. Yeah. Irrespective of how great Harvard might be or any other institution mm -hmm. to have somebody of his prowess um, and stature mm -hmm. to reach out and invite you. Uh, what was it? Because I got to know what would make you say, forget all that. I got to go over here. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't care about Harvard's legacy. Okay. I, st I still don't really. I don't, I'm not into that. So I'm kind of with you on that because I, legacies, I don't wear a Harvard ring. I yeah. don't wear. I you know don't, why? I don't because have a, legacies are for other. That's other people's stuff. No, no. A legacy is what people, a, a person wants if they themselves don't point. have the. That's other the, people's stuff. Yeah, so, when you have your so own legacy, legacy, you don't need a legacy. The legacy is the luminosity shed upon them by others who have actually achieved things. Well, well, okay, so, that's exactly what I meant. But uh, thanks for making me look stupid. <laughs> 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 I couldn't say it like that. But oh, the, no, that makes the sense. luminosity beaming, right. down, beaming down on down. others. Right. So I try. I don't instead of radiating that's why your I don't, own. I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't radiate your own damn. Radiate your own light. Don't legacy. worry about being lit by something. So I had else. nothing to do with it. What is it? It was. I want to know. Yeah. I really I'll, I'll tell you. What I'll tell it? you. Okay. Uh -huh. At the time, I'm in middle school and into high school. I had subscribed to Scientific American. And my favorite part was a section called About the Authors. And for every author, even the double authored papers, right. I picked everyone for that was on astronomy and physics. For every author, I made a grid of the colleges that had accepted me mm -hmm. and whether the author got their undergraduate degree their masters, their PhD, or where they were on the faculty. And for every one of them, and I made a checklist. Uh, how old were you when uh, you did this? 15, 15, 16, 16, something like that. Okay, so, no, no, that, I was applying to college, that's 17, I'm 17 okay. now. Okay, well, same, 16, 17, yeah, that's yeah. when okay. you start, go right. ahead. So then I made this list, and I put a check for each of the schools that I was accepted, where all these people came from. And I said, if I'm gonna be a scientist one day, mm -hmm. with the stature of who has been invited to write for Scientific American, that's one of the hallmarks of Scientific American, actual scientists write those articles. But, Basically, that's, that's what it is. Right, yeah. So I put it, and I made the list, and then Harvard was like two or three times longer on that grid than any other school I was accepted to. Wow. So I just said, that's that it. That makes sense. That, that, that's, that's it. And then I would later learn that part of the reason why it was so long is the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, the government doing astrophysics, has their base co-located with the Harvard College Observatory. Boom. So so there's a larger complex there. Of course. But so it but that's great, no, right? So course, whatever yeah. my interests are, there's going to be somebody in arm's reach that can who, I, who can actually support who, that who interest. Support, support that interest. Wow. So, See, I made so that's a the, list <laughs> of what schools were in state and uh basically would accept a high C student. <laughs> I see. And by that, I mean the juice. <laughs> <laughs> Does that juice still exist? Yeah, I see. Man, that, I see it's okay. still the juice. All right. All right. So, so that's why. So I, I wanted to come up with an objective measure that was not swayed by any legacy or, oh, you surely you're going to Harvard. It's like, no. You moneyballed college acceptance. <laughs> You money balled college no, acceptance. I'm just saying, I, that's pretty cool, man. If, if analysis is money ball, then that's then, what it is. then let the ball roll. Right on. But anyhow, so just to close that out. Okay. So we got Carl Sagan, Gerard Kuiper, yeah. who later we credit the naming of these all these objects in the outer solar system, that's right. the Kuiper Belt. That's right. Uh, where Pluto is found. Get over it. Pluto's the first and most prominent member of the Kuiper Belt. 
Just Damn. to let you know. But yeah. but anyhow, this just and the, in the episode we address some of the tension that's between scientists and the co competitiveness. Uh, I think if that's kept in check, it can be good to, mm -hmm. to pump your 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 um, your creative urges to get ahead or to stay ahead. But anyhow, I think there was a, uh, that episode had to be in there just so you knew uh, what Carl Sagan's actual legacy would become in this I just, world. I just love the fact that you use this opportunity and uh, Kuiper as a means to throw shade on Pluto. <laughs> you, it's like you kick Pluto Shudo out. Does, Pluto doesn't mean to, need me to throw shade. It's already so far out, it lives in oh, shade. Oh, damn. Damn, you just insulted. You can't say, where's the sun? I can't, oh. where's the sun? Is that it over there? But pa, is that the sun? Oh, no. Am I so far away? Oh. I can't see. Well, he kicked Pluto out of the Harvard Club and put him in the <laughs> Friars Club. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Anyhow, so we have a, a, a debt of gratitude to Carl Sagan for yeah. pioneering astrobiology, right. for including sort of biological uh, objectives. Fusing these disciplines. And bringing it to NASA to help explore. Yeah. This, so all of that. Yeah. It would all look very different were it not for Carl on cool. that landscape. That's excellent. Right. Man. Plus, we wouldn't be here if he weren't here either because right. he was in the first episode that then became the next one, then the third episode, and right. I'm, the, I'm the host. I thought you were going to say because he's your father, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Carl is your father. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, that's when you start referencing Star Wars, it's time it's, to end it's the time segment. To end this segment. All right, all right. right. Chuck, we got to end this episode. All right. That uh, was just episode six. Next week, episodes seven and eight, when we take a look at in depth behind the scenes discussion of what went into making the cosmos. We'll see you then.